in 1960, as a student at Columbia University in New York, I happened to see a documentary made in America about Indian civilization and Indian history, which was screened for the students. It was so absurd, so prejudiced against everything that was Indian, that I got worked up. It provoked me to go up on the dais, take the mic and say how absurd this film was. My professor, who was presiding over the event, calmed me down and said, look, take this as a challenge. When you get back to your country, make a film which you think is authentic to represent Indian history and civilizational values. On the spot, spontaneously, I said I take it as a challenge. But I didn't realize how tough it was going to be. It meant 12 years of waiting to raise the financial resources and four more years of actual production time to complete my four-hour documentary, which I eventually titled Indus Valley to Indira Gandhi when I released it in 1976. The single most ambitious and most expensive non-fiction film ever produced here. The first Indian film to be distributed under the internationally renowned banner of Warner Brothers. Indus Valley to Indira Gandhi on the 5,000 year drama of Indian history and culture filmed in fabulous monuments of long forgotten empires as well as in living palaces of recent history. An encyclopedic sweep on the diverse facets of India, the religions, the wars, conflicts, intrigue, our abject poverty, and our heroic efforts to solve our problems, our moral strengths and weaknesses. Indus Valley to Indira Gandhi is Krishnaswami's magnum opus. An epic drama of the Indian people. Knowledge explodes. It changes your perception of India. For Dr. Krishna Swami's uh, in Indus Valley to Indira Gandhi, uh, in those days used to be a stock for all of us. All of us had to see it, should see it, see it as many times for you to know what history which has not been taught to you. Of course, there are versions which are coming out. But it is a fact that that was the first ever well-documented uh, picture-based, uh, movie-based, history narrative which was made not in a documentary fashion, although it may be a documentary, but in a fashion in which all of us could see it and benefit from it. So that was a great service rendered and uh, I think that kind of a, uh, thinking out of the box, thinking well in time before the time comes, you know, you think in advance. Those are the kind of things I think India has always been proud of. On demand from educationists and leaders cutting across political lines, we have pleasure in presenting this four-hour documentary again to a new generation of audience online in four parts of about one hour each. When India became a republic 25 years ago, we wrote our constitution in English. We publish many English newspapers and journals. As a filmmaker, I've written the script for this film in English. Our business language is also English, because English is an Indian language. We adopted it a century ago. My wife is a biochemist, working on research problems, some of which may not have been understood even a few decades ago. However, she is fond of jewellery, dress, literature and music, introduced during the Muslim rule of India between 300 and 800 years ago. In leisure time, I browse through my library and read books in my mother tongue, Tamil, the literature of which goes back to the beginning of the Christian era.
We are vegetarians in our family. Vegetarianism is a habit due to the influence of two men on our forefathers, the Buddha and Mahavira, some 500 years before Christ. On religious occasions, I introduce myself as a descendant of a shadowy founder of one of the Indo-Aryan clans who made India their home between three and four thousand years ago. I visit a temple built by the Kalinga kings rather recently, a thousand years ago. And there I worship God Shiva in the form of a lingam. The lingam is considered to be a phallic emblem. The linga has been worshipped by people from the time people of the Indus Valley civilization worshipped God in that form between four and five thousand years ago. In India, we live concurrently in fifty centuries. Hence, while narrating our story, we will choose those aspects of our 5,000-year history which are relevant for an understanding of India today. years ago, man was just emerging from the Stone Age and had begun to use copper implements. There are still hill tribes in remote parts of India even today in this level of culture. In the third millennium before Christ, civilization in the nature of an organized government in an urban setting developed simultaneously in the river valleys of the Nile, the Euphrates and the Indus. There are several sites of the Indus Valley culture, ranging almost a thousand miles north-south along the Indus River. The main archaeological sites are Harappa and Mohanjadaro, now in Pakistan, and Kalibangan and Lothal in India. At Kalibangan, we see organized parallel streets, north-south and east-west, lined with houses constructed with unburnt mud bricks of uniform size and quality. The areas which are often wet, such as wells and drainage channels, are lined with burnt bricks.
the Indus city had elaborate drainage systems, the first of its kind in the world. This unique sewerage should have obviously been maintained by some municipal organization. The house ceilings were laid on wooden rafters. The average house size was 30 feet by 30 feet. Some houses had rooms in the first floor also. The bathrooms indicate that the Indus people, like the present day Indians, took bath by pouring water over themselves from a pitcher. One of the very recent excavations at Lothal has revealed that the Indus people were mariners also, for we find these fantastic docks. Lothal was obviously the port through which the Indus people maintained contact with their contemporaries in the Middle East. The Indus pottery and other articles show that the Indus culture never really died totally. The kind of pots used in the areas around Kalibangan have an unmistakable resemblance to the pottery of the Indus age in design and the painted motifs. The beads and jewels show an urbane culture with a developed concept of beauty. The Indus Valley seals carry a script which is yet to be deciphered. They indicate intense commercial activity. Balances and weights of the period have also been found. The Indus people made terracotta figures, one of which shows a solid wheeled cart. We found such a primitive cart in operation in a field in Uttar Pradesh during filming. The Indus people also made bronze figures, the most famous of which is a girl interpreted by some scholars as a dancer. Notice the bent hip posture, which is unique to Indian art and which recurs throughout the different periods of Indian art. The new Kalibangan village near the excavation site in the belt between Kalibangan and Ropar further to the north have houses built with the same kind of unburnt bricks. Their wooden rafter ceilings are covered with mud bricks and plastered with mud. A resemblance to the Indus culture is very strong indeed. The Indus people grew sesamum and sesamum oil is an important edible oil in India even now. In the villages, sesamum is crushed in a bullock powered wooden mill, a method which has been in use for several thousand years. people were also the first to cultivate cotton in the world, still an important crop in India. Some scholars maintain that the inhabitants of the Indus Valley were Dravidians, now concentrated largely in South India. While this has not been established, we know for certain that among the Indians today live the descendants of the Indus Valley people. The cause for the end of the Indus cities is disputed. One version is that the Indo-Aryan tribes from Central Asia invaded the region and destroyed the Indus Valley cities in a war of conquest. The Rig Veda of the Hindus, the earliest extant religious literature of the world, still held sacred, describes the fall of many big cities to the Aryan god Indra. These may actually refer to the Indus cities. With the exception of Lothal, the Indus cities perished suddenly. Lothal, however, seems to have survived maintaining the Indus culture and evolving gradually with the times. The Central Asian tribes of Aryans who conquered these northwestern regions of India in the second millennium before Christ were nomads and their wealth primarily consisted of cattle. They described the local tribes as Dasas. The Dasas were dark-skinned Aborigines while the conquerors were fair-complexioned. 
they were differentiated on the basis of varna, literally meaning color. A passage in Rigveda gives the religious interpretation of the four varnas. In a primeval sacrifice, the first thousand-headed superhuman man rose. The Brahmin, priest, emerged from his face. The Kshatriya, warrior, from his shoulders. The Vaisya, tradesman, from his thighs. The Sudra, servant and farmer, from his feet. The institution of Varna was the precursor of the later day caste, although Varna and caste are not to be confused with each other. The Aborigines and local tribes were outside this fourfold division of man. The invaders settled and developed as indigenous people and spread all over the north in a few centuries and to South India shortly thereafter. In these early years of the second millennium before Christ, by the mixture of Aryan, Dravidian and other regional cultures evolved the Hindu religion and social order, the Hindu way of life as it crystallized and took almost its present day form. basic unit of the Hindu society was the joint family. The joint family, as it evolved almost 3,000 years ago, remained the vital force of the social order until the mid-20th century. The patriarchal joint family consisted of several grandchildren, cousins, in-laws, unmarried sisters and wives of a polygamous household living under one roof and obeying the leader, the eldest male member. The individual was a less important entity than the family itself. Except for regional variation, property was inherited in the patriarchal line. The father was more or less a trustee of the family property and had no absolute rights over it. The family was fully involved in the sraddha, the ceremony of annual offerings to the departed souls of their ancestors. The son performs this to three generations of departed persons by name and to all other anonymous and remote ancestors. This ceremony is performed by most Hindus even today and the family ties are strengthened. Orthodox Hindus from all over come to the town of Gaya in Bihar to perform such a ceremony at least once in their lifetime. All decisions regarding the education, matrimonial choice and avocation of the individual were taken for him by the head of the family. The individual had little personal liberty, but to compensate for it, he had a tremendous sense of security. More often than not, these days, sraddha is performed not because the man believes that the sacrifice really benefits his dead father. It is a ritual performed as part of accepted behavior. This man offering oblations in the fire may be a civil servant or a company executive who does not even know the meaning of the chants. Socialization and mobility of the 20th century, a new education and personal ambition have undermined the joint family. The social importance is rapidly shifting to the individual from the family. The new family today consists of parents and the unmarried children only. The Aryan tribes began to settle down and establish kingdoms more than a thousand years before Christ. Thank you. 
Recently, archaeologists have excavated Kausambi, one of the citadels of Vedic culture in its early emergence into full urban statehood. By this time, kingship had evolved to command the paraphernalia of a royal court, courtiers, advanced weapons and military might. Iron had been smelted and the range of metals used included tin, lead, silver, besides gold and copper which were already known. trades and crafts appeared. entertainment industry had come up. The elephant was tamed and used particularly to clear forests and lift heavy logs for building and transport. The forest departments of India use them even today for such purposes. Later, the elephant began to be used in warfare. Recently excavated Hastinapura was an important part of the story of Mahabharata, India's greatest and most ancient epic. Mahabharata, the longest poem in the world, narrates the story of a war between cousins of the Kuru clan, a historic event written down later with many poetic exaggerations. The pottery and other articles excavated show a lower level of development than what the literary tradition suggests. The great war itself is said to have been fought at Kurukshetra, a pilgrim center with a sacred tank associated with the epic. While religious tradition places the war in 3100 BC, most historians believe the war was fought about 1400 years before Christ. With the chanting of Vedic hymns, the Brahmin Purohita assumed importance among the courtiers. One reason for the rise of the Brahmin even above the temporal king was that only he knew how to perform yajnas and protect the world as well as the king's power. Many yajnas, sacrifices were performed. They were meant for the consecration of a new king or his elevation to the position of an emperor. They were also meant to please the gods, bring rains and avert natural calamities. Even today, the orthodox Hindus get together and organize Egnyas. This Egnya here was performed in 1975 in a temple at Kanchipuram. minerals, 
metal, silk, gemstones, and many other materials are offered to the gods in the sacrificial fire. While the sacrifice carried the offerings to the many gods of the Vedic pantheon, Agni, the god of fire, had a special exalted place not only in his own right, but also as the conveyor of man's offerings to the other gods. In its quest for an understanding of reality, the Veda asks, is there only one Agni or are there many? How could fire be one and many at the same time? For the Vedic poet found fire in the domestic hearth. He found it as a potential in the firewood, in the lightning in the skies, and in the sacrificial fires. This kind of speculation of the mystic authors of the Vedas made them wonder about the nature of the elements of man, life and death, and created the metaphysical and philosophical base of Indian thinking for all time to come. In the centuries immediately following the Vedas came up a set of Upanishads, writings of mystics and sages who had felt a profound religious experience. The concepts would suffer oversimplification in an omnibus attempt like this. However, basically they postulate three principles. First is the transmigration of the soul. Second is karma. Thirdly, the individual soul of man is no different from God himself, the Brahman, the infinite, who is matter and energy, who manifests himself in things living and non-living. The individual soul can try to end the cycles of birth and rebirth and regain union with the universal soul by conscious effort. To achieve this end, men became ascetics, renouncing the world and all its pleasures. Becoming an ascetic had its attraction also. One is supposed to get a mastery of the mysterious powers of the world to control mind and matter, capable of performing miracles. Beyond rational thought, men of this kind continue to live in India. But the religious experience of a true mystic reaches a realm where they transcend the miraculous. Swami Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who lived in our own times, explained that he had lived as a Hindu, Christian and Muslim and experienced God through every path. A large number of religious-minded, educated Hindus today do not seek their religious experience through miracles. To them, God need not be demonstrated. However, for the masses, the demonstration of psychic powers, whether real or fraudulent, is the basis of faith. The texts of the Vedas were unwritten. They were transmitted from generation to generation for over 3,000 years by a rigorous training where the gurus taught them to obedient students. Today, the Vedic schools continue their tradition of teaching them without a change of syllable or a change of intonation. It is now recognized that Sanskrit is a remote cousin of all European languages, having a common ancestry in their parent language, some early speech of the Indo-Aryans. By the time of the Mahabharata war, or soon thereafter, the Sanskrit alphabet had been evolved, one of the most scientific alphabets of the world, phonetically conceived and codified. The manuscripts were written with styles on palm leaves. Collections of palm leaf manuscripts are being studied by experts. 
Panini's Sanskrit grammar of the 5th century BC is one of the remarkable intellectual achievements of mankind. A comparable grammatical work did not appear in any language outside India almost till the 19th century. Such grammar and precise alphabet were required for the intricately abstract thinking that had developed. The subtleties and nuances of expression required exceptional nuances of grammar and vocabulary. Concurrent with metaphysical speculations at this time, sacrificial Brahmanism, killing beasts to please the gods, had become so powerful that they began to be resented. In this milieu, one of the greatest men of the world was born in India. Relinquishing the palace and comforts of his birth, Siddhartha journeyed to the forest. By deep meditation under a Bodhi tree, he attained enlightenment and became the Buddha. The Buddha opposed the orthodox cults cruel to animals and men and began sowing the seeds of universal love and humanism. By the side of the tree, at the very site where the Buddha attained enlightenment, stands the temple of Bodhgaya. No one before Christ, except the Buddha, preached the ideal of love so passionately. Here is a vow of a Bodhisattva prescribed by the Buddha, heard against images of contemporary India. I take upon myself the deeds of all beings. I take their suffering upon me. I bear it. I do not draw back from it. I do not tremble at it. I have no fear of it. I do not lose heart. I must bear the burden of all beings, for I have vowed to save all things living. I think not of my own salvation, but strive to bestow on all beings the royalty of supreme wisdom. So I take upon myself all the sorrows of all the beings. preached from this peak at Rajagraha, a place associated with another great soul, Mahavira, who was born in Vaisali in the same area of India, near the river Ganga. A contemporary of the Buddha and founder of the Jain religion, Mahavira propagated compassion for all living things, including insects. His ahimsa, or non-violence, influenced Indian thinking profoundly. Politically also, the center of activity had shifted east to the banks of the Ganges. Following the period of Buddha, the kingdom of Magadha gained prominence. The Magadhan capital was Pataliputra, near modern Patna and Bihar. Even as this kingdom was expanding and gaining importance, an east-west meet was taking place in northwestern India. Emperor Alexander of Macedon had conquered the Middle East countries and began attacking India. Although Alexander hardly ever ruled any part of India directly, his partial victory affected and influenced the subcontinent of India. Guided by an able minister Chanakya, one Chandragupta Maurya came to power at Pataliputra. He and his son expanded and annexed large territories of land. The Mauryan state was the first vast Indian empire. At this time, all metal foundries and mines, besides spinning and weaving workshops, were owned by the Mauryan state. Land belonged entirely to the state, and the farmer cultivated it for the state.
state controlled some of the manufacturing activities, while it carefully supervised others which were in private hands. Large merchants flourished, such as one who controlled over 500 potters' workshops and sold the wares over the whole of the Gangetic Plains. Grain prices were controlled in the market. They were bought by the state when harvest was good and the grain released to bring down the price in times of scarcity. Chanakya's book also recommends seizure of food grains from rich men's storage when the country faces a famine. In his book, he lays down a road toll to take care of road maintenance and insurance against theft. laid down differential rates of interest on borrowing based on the importance of the different crafts and professions and the relative risk. He also prescribed differential customs tariff on essential and non-essential commodities. His humane consideration includes fair treatment of servants and slaves. succeeding Indian rulers in different ways. Modern India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, lived and worked from this house. Unconsciously, perhaps, he strictly followed Chanakya's rigorous rules of discipline for a ruler. Chanakya compares the ruler to an ascetic, a guardian of public property and a father of all his subjects. He allows a king four and a half hours of sleep and three hours of personal life per day to enable a ruler to spend all his time on matters of state. Chandragupta Maurya's grandson, Ashoka, at first followed the militarist policies of his dynasty and expanded his empire by war. But after succeeding in the war with Kalinga in modern Orissa, he suddenly realized the cruelty and futility of war. In this battlefield, he became a devout follower of the Buddha. Ashoka was a noble king of India, one of the greatest rulers of the world. Ashoka took it upon himself to spread the message of the Buddha and make a moral conquest of the world. He built a Buddhist stupa at Saranath, where the Buddha delivered his first sermon after enlightenment. Ashoka erected stone pillars all over his empire, which carried his edicts. Those which are still there, such as this one at Vaisali, are remarkable not only for the humanity of the message, but for the advanced technology of manufacturing them. Measuring over 40 feet, weighing nearly 50 tons, each pillar is carved from a single rock, polished to a very high degree, and transported several hundred miles to its present position. The brilliant capital of an Ashokan column with four lions has been adopted as the national insignia of modern India. Ashoka's messengers toured many parts of Asia, converting kings and commoners to the loving faith of the Buddha. 
Buddhism became a world religion. Near the battlefield where Ashoka adopted the Buddhist faith nearly 300 years before Christ. Very recently, the Japanese have honored the emperor by building a monument for peace. Ashoka extended his royal patronage to encourage vegetarianism, which became since then a characteristic feature of the higher class Hindu. Today, all over India, there are vegetarian hotels offering different regional recipes. Even in the internationally reputed Western-style hotels in India, whether it is the privately owned Taj Intercontinental Bombay or the prestigious Ashoka Hotel, New Delhi, owned by the India Tourism Development Corporation of the government, the restaurants make it a point to offer choice vegetarian food, along with an international cuisine. The Buddhist stupa at Sanchi was originally built in Ashoka's time and later expanded and improved by different people in the succeeding centuries. The stone fence around the stupa and the stone balustrades are modeled after village fences of the period made of wood and bamboo. The important feature of Sanchi consists of four elaborately carved gateways to the stupa very intricately worked bas relief figures depict the village life of the period, tales from the Buddha's life, animals and birds, as well as mythical demons. figures on the gateways present the same bent hip posture reminiscent of the Indus bronze girl. Barhut of the same age as Sanchi is in ruins. A part of Barhut monument has been reconstructed at the Indian Museum, Calcutta. Ashoka's successors were meek men, and India entered an era of confusion and conflict. Among the various invaders from the northwest came the Greeks, who had settled in Bactria in the Middle East. They were foreign invaders for a short period, but they got absorbed in India and settled down for good in small kingdoms of northwest India. The Greeks brought with them their concepts of astronomy and astrology. Even during the composition of the Vedas, the heavens had been charted in India by means of 27 lunar mansions or nakshatras. India also knew and worshipped nine planets of the solar system, in which they included the two nodes of the moon. 
To this were added the 12 signs of the zodiac when the Greeks arrived. Astrology developed into an important phase of Indian thinking. Astrology may mean business on the footpath. It may also mean a prosperous business as that of Pandit Kariyur Sinvasachari of Madras, who at 75 practices from his comfortable large house, built on his own earnings as a reputed astrologer of half a century. There are astrological magazines and conventions. But the strongest hold of astrology today is in arranging marriages, since most people believe that a matching of horoscopes will result in a successful marriage. The two centuries just before and after Christ saw also the codification of Indian law. Generally, the kings were not expected to legislate, but only follow Dharma Shastras, codes of law and righteousness enunciated by lawgivers such as Manu. Manu was a strong believer in the hierarchy of Varna. Even in the administration of justice, he considered man to be basically unequal. If a sudra had slandered a Brahmin, he was fined eight coins. If a Brahmin scolded a sudra, he was fined only two coins. Not that Manu was always favorable to the higher class. If, for instance, a Brahmin and a Sudra both had committed theft, the Sudra was fined eight times the value of the stolen article, whereas the Brahmin had to pay 64 times the value. The higher classes were expected to behave better. Some of the most humane laws of Manu were with respect to the conduct of war. A king and his soldiers would go to hell if they harmed a citizen who was not in actual combat. An unarmed opponent can be taken prisoner but not ill-treated or killed. Greek ambassador to the Mauryan court Megasthenes records that even as a large battle was in progress somewhere nearby, the farmers were working peacefully. There were further invasions to the northwest frontiers. Scythian tribes waged war and were closely followed by Kushanas of Central Asia. This is an authentic sculpture of Kanishka without the head, the important king of this dynasty who founded the Saka era in 78 AD, now revived as the official era of the government of India. A new school of sculpture developed under Kanishka. The Gandhara school, somewhat influenced by Western tradition, has Indian characteristics. The Western influence during Kanishka's reign was largely due to the flourishing trade with Rome. Contemporary with the Gandhara school was the Mathura school of sculpture, which developed at Mathura, not far from modern Delhi. The birthplace of the legendary god Krishna. Mathura was more Indian and original than Gandhara in its visual concepts. Mathura sculpture was based on secular as well as religious themes. Sculptors 
had made several images of Jain saints. The Jain religion, founded by Mahavira at the time of the Buddha, was becoming popular all over the country. Here at Shravanabalagala in South India, Jains from all over assembled to worship the gigantic Jain image of Gomateshwara on a hillock. We are using this 10th century monolith while dealing with Mathura's culture of a much earlier period only to illustrate an idea. Since the Hindu social order gave only third place to the merchant class, after the priests and the warriors, the wealthy merchants probably found it better to belong to the classless Jain religion, which also favored high ethical values of the Hindu religion of the day. The Jains have generally always been a prosperous group. To return to the Mathura school of sculpture, it had the patronage of Jains to start with. Some scholars conjecture that these Jain images were an inspiration to the Buddhists of the day to make similar images of the Buddha. Whatever the truth of that hypothesis, it is here in Mathura that the now world-renowned figure of the Buddha was first conceived and sculptured. Buddhism itself had developed into different ideological sects. The two major schools interpreted the main teachings of Buddha differently. The two main systems spread in two different directions outside India. The Hindu devotional poet Jayadeva of Bengal, among others, interpreted the Buddha as one of the ten incarnations of God Vishnu. The main ideas of rebirth and karma being common to Hindu and Buddhist faiths, Hinduism began to absorb the non-violence and love of Buddhism, shedding its own sacrificial Brahminism. At the temple of Bodhgaya today, the Buddha is worshipped by Hindu as well as Buddhist priests. Krishna was emerging as the most important of the ten incarnations of Vishnu. The Mahabharata legend has it that Krishna was born in Mathura, whose sculpture fashioned the Buddha. The Krishna image in the preceding thousand years had developed into a character which could outdo all hero patterns of the world. Born to parents in prison, Krishna is miraculously taken to foster parents. As a baby, he could kill a demoness by sucking the life out of her. He is a daredevil boy, killing a monster serpent in the deep Yamuna river, conquering and killing many other demons. By holding up a hillock on his little finger, he saves his clan from rain and thunder. He steals butter from the cowherd's houses and gets away with every mischief. He plays his mellifluous flute and lures not only the girls, but even the cows, deer and peacocks.
His special love is for Radha, his consort, not wife. Friend and advisor to the hero of Mahabharata, Krishna delivers him a sermon at the battlefront, the Bhagavad Gita. Vyasa, the great author of the Mahabharata, obviously found the all-pervading image of Krishna to be his ideal vehicle to reach everyone. Being a chapter of Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita was composed probably around 500 BC. Your business is with the deeds, not with the fruits thereof, says the Gita. It calls men away from the loneliness of renunciation into the world of actions. Actions without attachments to the fruits thereof. Bhagavad Gita, translated into many major languages of the world, is the central scripture of modern Hinduism. It has influenced many minds of the world. It is the basis of Aldous Huxley's The Perennial Philosophy. It has inspired every national leader of modern India. However, the Gita is held sacred by some people who prefer to worship the book as a sacred object rather than as a great way of life to be lived. The period immediately before and after Christ was one of political fragmentation of India. No large empire such as that of Mauryas had come up till early in the 4th century when another king Chandragupta assumed power at Pataliputra. He and his son conquered many petty and large kingdoms and the Gupta empire began to flourish. The Guptas paid attention to education not only in the traditional system of the individual guru and sishya, mentor and student, but also by promoting university centers of higher learning such as Nalanda, often referred to as the Golden Age. The Gupta period was at its zenith, particularly under Chandragupta II. Nalanda mainly housed Buddhist monasteries. Apart from Hindu and Buddhist theology, secular learning was also pursued here. At the height of its glory, Nalanda had nearly 10,000 students, supported by revenues from enormous villages, granted by the Gupta and the succeeding kings. Other Buddhist and Jain monasteries across the land also served as centers of learning. Students of any faith were admitted here. Nalanda had been patronized even before and after the Gupta age. Its main temple has constructions one over another, revealing different layers of construction. Nalanda was a great academic center for nearly a thousand years. Metallurgy made astounding progress. This iron pillar near Delhi erected during the Gupta period as a memorial, is about 23 feet high. As a single iron piece, it is of a size and weight which could not have been produced in the best foundries of Europe till the 19th century. It obviously demanded high technical proficiency to make this in such a manner that it shows no signs of rusting after about 15 centuries now. Another branch of applied science which reached a high degree of development was pharmacology. The ancient Indian systems of medicine were now codified by Susruta and Charaka. There are also other regional systems. These systems continue in practice today almost all over India. Thousands of herbs and other vegetable and animal matter formed part of the pharmacopoeia. Among other organizations, the Indian Medical Practitioners Association at Madras 
today manufactures these drugs for nationwide sale. Although they were unaware of bacteria, the Jain theologians conjectured the presence of living organisms floating in air and water, too infinitesimally small to be seen by the naked eye. Limited kinds of surgery were also performed. A high degree of specialization was achieved, in particular in bone setting, an art which is practiced even today with astounding results by specialists of the ancient school of medicine. This small town, Puttur in South India, gets patients from far and near for bone setting. The native doctors of Puttur have a policy of giving free treatment, accepting whatever fee is offered by the patient. By the fifth century, Hatha Yoga had also made progress. Dr. Chandrahasan Johnson, professor of radiology at the CMC hospital at Velour, recently happened to see a street entertainer performing a feat. The young man was able to swallow more than a dozen water snakes and a few frogs alive. alive again by just spitting them out. To investigate this, Dr. Johnson conducted an X-ray film study. The snakes were given barium meal before they were swallowed. Dr. Johnson got these splendid X-ray movie images, establishing that the snakes really played around the man's stomach. The study shows that the man is able to control his stomach and his gullet and increase or decrease the intra-abdominal pressure at will. In short, he is exercising control over what is otherwise an involuntary reflex. Dr. Johnson has studied over 50,000 cases of barium meal and has come across hundreds of cases which exhibit paraphysiological phenomena. Paraphysiology is a study of physiology which is abnormal but not pathological. Here is his record in X-ray movie of the voluntary control of stomach muscles and sphincters by a person who has achieved such control. The subject is able to lift half his stomach into the chest and take it back. By no means are these street entertainers yogis. But control over the involuntary nervous system is one of the key aspects of Hatha Yoga. A Raja Yogi, when he attains perfection, is supposed to get total control over his body, including all the reflexes which are normally involuntary, as well as control over the mind, including the subconscious. <laughs> 